Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of A Cup of Coffee with Bill. I'm excited to bring you my guest today, Jim Kaler, who is the head of sports gambling education at Ohio University. Jim, welcome to the show. Hey, Bill, thanks to be here, and I, I brought my cup of joe. <laughs> Beautiful, in, in the spirit. Yeah. Um, so, Jim, you've made an interesting shift. You've been leading Ohio University's sports administration program for many years now. You're a common face around Athens and the golf courses there. Why talk about the switch to running the sports gambling education program and what you saw with that? Well, it's a bit of a downshift for me because, as you know, I was I haven't been running the MSA program for a while now. Matt Cacciato is the MSA director. But in July, I stepped down from the, the role as the executive director of the AECOM Center for Sports Administration. And it was time. Uh, I'm 62, probably got another three years left. And I'm happy that Matt Cacciato was taking over both roles. He's, uh, for, for some of our alumni that might be tuning in, he's just a great guy. And if they haven't met him yet, they they should reach out to him. Uh, you'll, you'll like him, and I think you know him, but former uh, lacrosse player at Syracuse when they were national champions. So any of our alums that are in lacrosse, Matt's a good guy to get to know. So anyways, this, the uh, step down when I did it, I said I'd really like to stay engaged with our sports gambling education program that we launched uh, officially back in May. And our goal here is really to become the thought leader when it comes to everything and anything around sports gambling. Uh, we have an executive uh, certificate. So if any of your listeners would like a special offer, uh, we can work it out. They got to go through you, but we'll give them 25% off one of our three courses, or if they want to buy the whole bundle, we'll give them 25% on off that. But the, the idea is, especially college athletics, they are ill-prepared to really understand sports gambling, to uh, train their staffs, their coaches, and their student athletes, because the training is pretty much like when you were playing the lacrosse at, at Mount St. Joe's. Bill, don't do it. <laughs> and then you'd get the you'd get the memo around March Madness. Bill, don't do it. That, and, that, and that it, was that was the extent of it. And guess what we did? Yeah, you did it right. But it's it's getting to be too big now. Over twenty two states have legalized uh, regulated sports wagering. That's good. That's illegal money being converted to money that'll end up in athletic departments and uh, team sponsorships and all that. So I, I'm not against uh, sports gambling. I'm, I'm a nickel and dime gambler at best, but I think there's so many nuances. Think of this, the sports gambling industry by 2023 will be larger than the sports business industry. Sports business industry is a $500 billion a year industry, but now that uh, regulated sports wagering, the regulated part of it, uh, is going legal. It's 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 bigger than this industry that we've all been working at. Mm -hmm. It's huge. No, and I one thing I saw in one of the newsletters I read just in October alone, New Jersey's sports gaming handle for October was eight hundred and three million dollars, and that was an increase of almost fifty two million from September of this year. You, and, I got uh, another stat I'll throw at you: monumental sports is in the process of building out a 30,000 square foot sports book with William Hill that's adjacent or part of their arena. They're, and right now, uh, they've converted some box office windows over to, to be the book. In their first month of August, $9.1 million was bet out of that lobby. <laughs> wow. Yeah. The, the numbers are just staggering, and I think there's so much interesting action going on at the books but then behind the scenes in the front offices with leagues and teams across the u.s and internationally and well as, as an industry we've been waiting for a way to connect this with our teams and our in-game and, and everything else and uh, regulated sports wagering legal sports legalized sports gambling it's the magic it's the magic button we've been waiting for. You know, you're, you're not going to take people's cell phones away from them. They're, that's just too intuitive. But if you can get them engaged, more engaged with your game by placing a prop bet in the second half, 
you know, your the level of of fan enjoyment goes way up, and it, it could be a a five dollar bet. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, bet heavily to that, but just the excitement of of winning five dollars after maybe you just spent ten dollars on a draft beer, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and and not to get too far off topic because there's one major thing that I brought you on to discuss today, but I mean that does a lot, I think, to start to fight back at the problem that a lot of teams and leagues have seen with their attendance is uh, competing against the in-home option by incentivizing using your phone with your DFS partner and some other factors in the stadium uh, yeah. to encourage and make you, you know, add some fun with the third screen. Uh, well, re rem remember that there's, there is millions of people that well, watch an event on TV in, a, in an arena or a stadium can only hold 20 or 70,000 people. So we've gotten really good at streaming and a number of games available, but we still have got to find a way to fill those those buildings coming out of COVID. I know it's a challenge right now. And and I think, um, you know, sports gambling is going to help us do it. Yeah, I think, I, I think as unfortunate as this situation has been with the pandemic, I think uh, sports gaming is really going to give that boost to getting people, you know, making it even more enticing attraction than it yeah. will be once you're allowed yeah. back in the stadium. And I, I can't wait to see what some of these new sports bars that our sports books are going to look like in Philadelphia. I think DraftKings is behind it, but it's going to be the largest restaurant slash sports bar in the state. So the, the way that, you know, it'll be like Dave and Buster's, but we'll be going to place bets and, having a fun night out with the, with the gang. Between them and the uh, Penn National Barstool Sports deal, I think there's, um, yep. it, it's going to be an explosion of venues like that outside of the stadium. We, we were that. excited with our sports gambling education program. We had a young man that uh, had a law degree uh, from North Carolina and uh, wanted to break into the, uh, you know, the legalized sports gambling world, but he, he took the class and he, just landed a job with Penn National. So um, some people are, are looking for a way to like, hey, how do I distinguish myself? Because there aren't a lot of experts in sports gambling. It's just right. it's, it's a new frontier, you know, and mm -hmm. education is uh, one way to get your foot in the door. Exactly. Uh, so jumping to the main topic that I wanted to discuss with you, and not only is it a very interesting case study around daily fantasy partners, um, but it's probably one of the best brand names that I've ever heard of. The relatively recent deal between the NFLPA and Monkey Knife Fight. Mm -hmm. um, the deal just at a baseline, and I don't think any financial terms have been shared, and they're still, I think, crafting a lot of the exact points in terms of the activation around the league. But the NFLPA takes a, an ownership stake in Monkey Knife Fight, um, that deal also brokered in part with one team partners in their um, licensing division. Um, you know, I thought it was an interesting quote in the deal from uh, one of the principals of one team partners that they saw this as an opportunity because players have been underutilized in these sponsorship deals around the league, whether it's FanDuel, DraftKings. And I don't disagree with that thought in doing research for today. Um, so how, you know, one, it's interesting this deal comes about because this was the one thing I think you wanted to stay away from for a long time was having anything to do with your players and a gambling partner. But now you have the players union of the most powerful, powerful sports league in the world taking ownership of a DFS company. And so I'd love to get your thoughts on the, the magnitude of this deal, but where you see it going just in terms of um, what the players have to, to gain from this. I think it's a tremendous yeah, it's, opportunity. It, it's an interesting play, and I don't know a lot of people at NFLPA, but the gentleman that I do know who now just started up a, a new company called Altius Sports Partners. They're, they're going to be major players in name, image, and likeness. They recently signed Texas to LSU that – gentleman I'm referring to is Casey Schwab, who's now the uh, CEO and founding partner at Altius. He used to handle the partnerships. And to me, it, it sounds like he was, you know, I'm just guessing that 
he's smart enough, sharp enough, and could see the category growing. So I'm sure that deal's got his fingerprints all over it. But when you look at it, players have a much stronger social media following than their teams or leagues. So um, when you when you try to find partnerships that can fit the whole association, uh, it's a challenge. You're, you're, you're probably not going to get Anheuser-Busch. You're not going to get Coca-Cola. But now, all of a sudden, we've got this new category that is white hot, red hot, white hot, whatever, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's, people are spending money like it, it's falling out of their pockets and because it's a gold rush. So if you think about it, DraftKings fan duel, they got in early. DraftKings is really the 800 pound gorilla in the category um, with the, the thought that someday if, if uh, sports gambling were to be legalized, they could just convert you. So, Bill, if they got to know you as a 18-year-old playing DraftKings today, they're going to want to be your sports book, your legal sports book. Uh, beautiful play, and, and it made sense. So along comes this new company that has got a different twist on the game, right? Right. And, and I think brilliant play uh, on their part. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know if DraftKings or, you know, I mean, couldn't DraftKings have done the same thing if they wanted to? Sure. Just, right. another, just another game. So uh, Monkey Knight Fight comes along, picks it up, and now they're getting some momentum with some big investment dollars from the NFLPA. Mm-hmm. And as you said, they're starting to do team sponsorships. So what I'm going to watch is, first of all, if you're a team, don't do an exclusive deal with any of these guys. Uh, the category is too hot right now, and the the money couldn't be big enough for exclusivity. So there's going to be a, a strategy battle, if you will, a strategy game. It, it's one thing to step up to the plate and put sponsorship dollars down. It's another thing to see who can activate it, and who comes up with the best creative. Because right now, if you're in – I know you're up in, in uh, Boston area, but if you were listening to a radio spot in uh, – New Jersey, uh, DraftKings and FanDuel, they're, they're willing to invest 250 or $300 on your first bet just to get you to open an account. Um, and I, I, I quote a story that came out of the SBGA, but the New Jersey Devils, the uh, president at the time was Hugh Weber, and he, he was projecting that the category would be worth $5 million a year. Think about that. $5 billion a year. I, I remember in the days that a million-dollar deal with your soft drink player was a big deal. Or in the beer category, if you could combine, you know, Miller, Coors, and AB, keep them both happy and get like a million five. And, and this is for a market like, like Cleveland. That was big money, but $5 million for, for the category? Sign me up. I want to go sell those, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Especially when you factor in, like you said, the acquisition cost to get somebody like you or I to sign up with one of these companies. They're, like you said, yeah. dropping $250, $300 matching. I, I, was, I was telling you before the call, and I can remember several years ago when DraftKings first got in, they were really spending a lot of money in advertising. But I was outside Brown Stadium and wasn't going to the game that day. I was just walking our uh, son-in-law from Ireland around the stadium because we're – we were at a family wedding in Cleveland, Pete's wedding, and uh, went by the DraftKings booth and, and said, hey, what's going on today? They were right on the spot. We'll give you a $50 voucher for concessions if you open a $50 account with us. Duh. That's a no-brainer, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. but, but yeah, yeah. And they're, you know, it's, it's like the early days of um, the cell phone. Now, I've, I've been with Verizon ever since my first cell phone. So if, if they can get you on board and provide great service, it could be a customer for life. Exactly. So going back briefly to the, the NFLPA monkey knife fight deal. So you, you have a partnership where the players have stake in it. What, how much more leverage does it give you? So if I look at some of the other team deals that monkey knife fight has, 
like the with their Tampa Bay Buccaneers, you know, it's got a lot of the standard elements that you'd see in a lot of the big time partnerships in venue signage, social media, standard assets that you or I would throw in any package for a partner of that magnitude. Right. Um, but it doesn't necessarily capture a lot from the player's perspective. You know, you've got your normal five players to watch each week um, mm -hmm. from the fantasy lens. How much more leverage does this give? You mentioned that, you know, you, you appropriately say that the players have a much better social media presence that's going to reach thousands upon thousands more people than the team will. But what exactly do you see players being able to do with this and the company being able to do with this now that you might bypass some of the normal licensing hurdles that you would see in a deal um, where you don't necessarily have ownership if I'm a player? Well, I, I should have studied up on it, but I think the NFL would let Tom Brady do an endorsement for Monkey Knife Fight as a game of chance. I'm not so sure uh, he'd have that ability to do it with them as a sports book. So I'm going to answer that question with the assumption that right now uh, the deal with, with Tampa Bay is with the team. Well, now they got to go get a player um, to, to leverage it. And so what do we know about sponsorship? Sponsorship is still the most effective way to build a one-on-one -on -one relationship with anybody. And if you're a fan of the – Buccaneers and a fan of Tom Brady, which I think you are, given your your background with the Patriots, uh, you're, you are now twice as likely to do business with that company and three times as likely to refer them to your friends. But that's only if the fans know about the deal. So right. that's where the activation and the strategy and the creative and the advertising um, come together. And, and so what do we know about the category? Does, you know, watch any NFL broadcast this weekend. You're going to see DraftKings all over. So mm -hmm. they're spending a lot of money early in the kind of the, the history of uh, regulated sports gambling. This is kind of a new history upon us um, for customer acquisition. But, you know, you, you tell me, Bill. Um, I think you're a loyal Brady guy. And let's say for a second that you're a Buccaneers fan. If, if he's endorsing it and the team's endorsing it, you're going to stay with DraftKings or are you going to cross, you know, go across the aisle? I, I'll definitely take a look at it, but I think a lot of it comes down to the, the content they're building around it. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, it, you know, if it's just a quote from him saying, hey, go check out this fun prop on Monkey Knife Fight, not necessarily, but yeah. if we're looking at, some wacky stuff so you're, in his... You're, you're right. You know, so what we, we used to say in grad school, content is king, right? Mm -hmm. uh, content marketing, content creation is the kingdom. <laughs> so what are they going to do to work that into the, their storylines and everything they do with their marketing, you know? Right. Uh, um, you know, if, if, if part of the content creation is Tom Brady talking about going up against my beloved Cleveland Browns, uh, and he's willing to put the time into it and, and recognizing the type of defense he's going to see that weekend. Hey, that's, that's some content I'm going to read, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think it's still, this is still a young deal with, you know, it's two months old at this point. So there's a lot to be seen, but it's an interesting step forward because if you look at the, the language around the NFL's exclusive deal with DraftKings it's the official Dan daily fantasy partner, but right. it's not the they're they're not doing any business with the sports book per se. But then, if you really look at it, where can you tell me the boundary between the daily fantasy side of the business and the sports book side of the business? It's yeah, it, it, it's funny you say that. I was at a conference not too long ago where the chief marketing officer of the NFL uh, didn't want to talk about gambling. It was like, well, any questions you don't, you don't want to touch. So. Um, Somebody in the audience, when it came to the formal Q and A, asked asked her a question about fantasy games. Oh, it's really not that big a deal. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And and the kind of money that the leagues are making now by selling their data and and uh, getting on the on the train as this category uh, and vertical opens up, sure they care about it. So I think it's uh, it's a major play now. What 
what I want to do, because you got me all inspired to study it more on, on monkey knife fight, it's not legal in Ohio yet, is they have kind of found a way to make me feel I might win, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you do your research on DraftKings and FanDuel, it's like 20% of the players win 80% of the money. I, I signed up uh, an account with uh, DraftKings just because I thought I needed to get a better handle on it. And uh, think I know the game of golf pretty well. So it was a tournament that weekend. And for my $25, I got a $25 bonus. You know, all right, I'll put a $5 bet down on the tournament. And I liked the way they organized it. It was um, a salary cap. So I was allowed to pick eight golfers going into the final bet. This will make it interesting. And I, I think, well, two or three of my golfers are doing pretty well. But I, for my $5, I'm competing with a pool of 2,500 people. So I go into the app later on and see, you know, what place did I come? I think I was like in 23rd hundred place out of 2,500 players because I'm competing against some guys that probably spend all night study this stuff and have the stats. I'm like, I don't have time to do all that. I don't have time to compete with those people, but I, the feeling I get with monkey knife fight is could be a couple of yokels like you and me that are just, all right, let's, let's throw in our five bucks and see how we do on a given day. Right. Exactly. And I, I don't have to worry about you picking a player before me. You and I can pick the same quarterback, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's kind of cool. Yeah. It, it, by, it, by the it, way, it, I would take Joey Burrow, um, just because he's uh, Athens' favorite son. And uh, once the Bengals figure out how to protect him and play a little more defense, uh, that, that kid's going to be all pro someday. Well, I, I think Bill Simmons calls him uh, Joey Covers right yeah. now. They, they, they can cover, uh, cover like the best of them. Yeah. Um, so I want to shift gears slightly, but something that we've been touching on is we'll be, we can both be pretty realistic. Um, mm hmm you know, with, with the pandemic where I think we're still, all, all the leagues are still trying to figure out what 2021 looks like. Um, the NCAA is trying to figure out how to hold March Madness in one contained location. And it may, it may become May Madness because of the timing of the vaccine and everything, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Exactly. So there, there are still a lot of uncertainties about what the 2021 season is going to look like for most leagues. What, what do you see as areas of opportunity for teams and leagues with DFS partnerships to capitalize on and make sure they're doing right by the sponsorship dollars that they're getting out of these deals? Because we're, we're looking at a pretty dead period once, uh, you know, ultimately once the NFL um, passes its season with the Super Bowl. And, you know, again, content is king. But yeah. what, what kind of content and how are you approaching if you're back in the VP seat with an NFL team or an NBA team, how are you approaching these deals in the off season to make sure that you're making them happy and that renewal discussion once the contract terms are up is an easy one. Like, Hey, we went through a tough time with you guys. We knocked it out of the park for you. Let's look at another five, six year term. Well, I, I, I think if, if we just, all agree, and I think you would, that teams have more fans outside their arenas and stadiums than they do in. You know, multitude more fans. So in, in that, if you're looking at your season that way, there is no off season. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we as, as entrepreneurs, as sports owners, or you're working for a team, there's no off season. It's just a matter of what happens on the calendar. I think the NFL, if you, if you watch the NFL Network, they do a marvelous job of taking you from the Super Bowl and then working you into a frenzy by the time the draft comes around. And, and then let's go global and in a good year, let's go play some uh, overseas exhibition games and let's just keep turning out the content. So uh, ESPN, I mean, oh my God, how many hours do you think ESPN dedicates to uh, NFL draft analysis, right? No, and, that time of year, 90% of their coverage. Yeah, yeah. And, and they'll just hammer it. So I think as technology continues to improve, uh, I, I like what Major League Baseball recently did. I think it was with Microsoft. But you're going to be able to dial up what you want. So think of all the 
films, highlights, and, and roles and reels that, that the leagues have access to. Mm -hmm. think, of, think of some of the behind the scenes content that the teams have. So it, it's really content creation being the kingdom if content's the king. Um, I, you know, how many, I, th this, this goes back probably four years ago, but the Baltimore Ravens, and some of your listeners might not know this, have six people that they're a news station. Their, their whole job is to shoot, produce, and, and edit content. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I left the Cavaliers in 02, you know, we had a production team that did our magazine show and our Jumbotron show. And, you know, it might have added up to, to, to three bodies, but they weren't producing content all week long. You know, let's, let's go back to the Cavaliers today. You could sit down with basically your news team and say, okay, coming out of the draft, we got the kid from Auburn. How are we going to approach it? He's coming in tomorrow. We've got to start telling the story. We've got to take people back to when the kid was in high school. Because mm -hmm. uh, fans are, they're, you know, fan is a derivative of fanatic. So they're fanatical. And they want to know as much as they can. And if they can just get access to it by – um, hitting a button on their phone, um, it's it's there. You know, it's, there there's an off season in terms of competition, but in terms of content creation and pushing out content, there is no off season. It's right. a twelve month business. And, and I only say that, and you know, may I I'm, can guarantee that I've missed some things, but I think there was a little bit of a lack of inspiration, but I also think that comes from the confusion and uncertainty around everything when the leagues were still trying to get seasons off the ground once oh, COVID, yeah. COVID took full force. But I, I think there, was, there wasn't a lot going on in that lull that capitalized on these assets that they have in the can in their in-house in already. So, yeah. you know, something like- Well, it's, 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 it's a little more difficult to have the type of access you'd want with your, the NFL just heightened their COVID plan. I think it was yesterday or two days ago. And now all, if you're a, with your position group, all of your meetings are virtual. There are no more in-person meetings. And when you're on campus, you're, you're probably masking up more than you were um, before. So sooner or later, we're going to get through it. And uh, I'm excited about the vaccine. But the, the teams that have used kind of this lull, and I think COVID has been a lull, it's a, it's a great time to explore new technology and try new things. Look, look at us. We're, we're talking on Zoom or whatever platform you're recording this on. And uh, a year ago, I would have been like, well, wait a minute. I, you know, I, I don't know how to get on there. I got to have a graduate assistant show me how this Zoom stuff works. And now it's, it's part of our mainstream. We, we produced uh, some pretty good content for our virtual symposium. Mm -hmm. You know, so like on the fly, I was doing some interviews like you're doing today. I had to learn how to hit the right buttons. But um, I think teams and sports properties' abilities to produce meaningful content, technology's come a long way in the last year. It really has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm excited. And I think this, now that we know what we're looking at and dealing with, I think we're going to see a lot of great stuff coming out of the front offices from marketing and content teams. Yeah. I, I really think it's going to be ramped up, but I think, um, you know, I, I want I, everybody digging I, deep I, into the archives. I think there's going to be more jobs there. If, if a kid can come out of a J school with the ability to write, hold the camera, produce content, edit it and, and turn it around. Um, you know, if you're good at it, there, there's going to be jobs there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So we're getting towards the end of the time. So I'm going to go to the three questions that I ask all of my guests. Uh, Jim, what is a book that you are reading or getting ready to start reading? Uh, well, I'm, it's the pioneers. Let me give you the author here in a second. Uh, is the pioneers is written by a gentleman by the name of David McCullough. And it takes a look at really the early exploration days of the great state of Ohio and has ties into the formation of Ohio University. Um, so I, I picked, it, picked it up on a, I think I saw it on a Twitter feed from one of my friends that was reading. I'm like, huh, 
think I'm going to check that out because I had heard about the book, but I, I find like so I'm about halfway through it, but I'm, I'm really kind of, you know, getting into the whole formation of the state and how our university came to be. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'll have to, as a proud Bob Catalum, I'll have to pick that one up. Yeah. Um, next question. What is, or who is uh, somebody that you're following right now in or outside of the sports industry? Hmm. Most recently, uh, I'll throw it out to anybody that's involved in name, image, and likeness. So if you're looking for one individual, and I just connected with him the other day, Casey Schwab, who I, I mentioned him earlier, but he is now the CEO and founding partner of Altius. And then Jim Caval. Caval runs a, a company out of Birmingham called Influencer. And they teamed up with Teamworks, our friend Mark Morris and company. Uh, but those two companies, I think, are going to be major players in the world of name, image, and likeness. And by August of 21, I think, you know, the Wild West is going to open up. And let's let's see who the players are, how the whole thing works. AJ Maestas and Navigate, they just came out with a study on what players are worth based on their social media scores. So what what a fascinating time in our industry. Yeah, that that's high on my list of topics to explore because I've just been fascinated, especially potentially on the niche sports in college that the, the money that could be there um, yeah. in terms of the value. And then uh, and at, at the same time, regulated sports wagering now that I'm doing what I'm doing. Cause it's like, I, it, you'll get a kick out of this. Cause yeah, I think growing up as a kid, you were a Reds fan, weren't you? Mm-hmm. So uh, somebody saw sports gambling education and the website and called in, and this gentleman has to be in his 80s. And I, I won't give his name out on air, uh, but I'm going to be interviewing him. And he was the lead investigator on the Dowd report that was looking into whether or not Pete Rose, uh, you know, gambled on baseball. Wow. How about that? Yeah. And he, he wants to, like, tell a story, which most of it, if you read the Dowd report, it's public record. but I can't wait to get that interview and then figure out how we put him into, you know, one of the courses that we have. Because in, in this sports gambling education, we're not just, you know, developing courses. We want to develop a community that is is just staying on top of it. So we're, we're doing monthly webinars and newsletters and everything else. So I'm meeting some really interesting folks through that process. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, it's been fascinating to follow since you guys started it up. Uh, and then final question, what, what do you have your eye on over the next three months? Next three months, huh? Company called Pfizer. <laughs> and, and how, well, and, and all of them really, but it, it's encouraging. And as you know, I have a daughter that's a nurse. So I, you know, I'm praying for a vaccine as, as quick as possible, but also, the timing of what happens over the next three months um, and how it plays into restoring confidence. So will, will I be more confident to go out to a game if I've, if I've got a vaccine? Probably, yeah. But right now with um, Katie's situation, uh, I got to play it smart because she's got a weakened immune system, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think like most people, so from, from a big picture, it would be the vaccine from a, more of a micro picture. It's going to be watching. I think I'd go back to name, image, and likeness. Like, who, who are the sellers going to be? So Altius and um, Influencer, they're not going to be peddling it. They're going to be educating and consulting on it. Right. So let me ask you, I'd love to get your opinion. If, if you're an athletic director at Ohio University and Learfield IMG is your rights holder, is it a conflict of interest if they're also selling partnerships for, um, you know, your star quarterback? That's, that's going to be, but it's, we're getting close. So if, if, if NIL is going to be up and running in August of 21, because that's what everybody's projecting, the, uh, the issues going in front of the NCAA presidents at the convention in January. Right. That, you know, like, so who, who's really going to come out? I mean, could you or I move to Columbus and, and start uh, repping players, you know? 
Yeah, well, and then what? what's it going to take to rep players to or to be a broker between brands and players? What certifications? Is it any kind of licensure? Well, the NCAA all right, so, it's, it's so, so what do we know about parents in high-flying recruits maybe in a sport like basketball? Okay. They're involved. Huh? They're, they're, well, they're, they're involved, but they, they already got this out, you know? Mm -hmm. What's in it for me? So... Uh, you know, if, if I were to represent a kid, I, I'm not going to put any guaranteed money on the line. Like this is, this is a new frontier, but uh, I'm going to keep a close eye on the uh, sports agency. So creative artists today could sign Joey Burrow. I think they did, but Joey's got a separate marketing agency. So how those two will come together, because legally you can't take money from an agent until you're done with your eligibility. But now you got this other, well, what about the endorsements? So it, it's gonna be the Wild West. It'll be really interesting to see how it all falls out. That's gonna, it's gonna be fascinating to watch. And if you're in that market and can get in early, do it because it'll, uh, it'll make you a man. Yeah, and we, we've got some students right now that are seriously looking how NIL is gonna evolve and is this a business? I mean, it's, it's, it's a new wave. It's gonna be a pretty big wave. Well, well, we'll have to bring you back on once I get my NIL conversation formed and another guest that can join us for that, uh, for that discussion down the road, but hopefully soon. Jim, thanks so much. This has been great, um, especially from your position within the sports gaming industry. Um, everybody, I'll drop a link and a discount code for the sports gambling education programs, like Jim mentioned earlier in the episode, and that will also be included in the um, notes on all streaming sites. Uh, the show is now available on Spotify and uh, Apple Podcasts. So thank you, and we will see you next time. Bill, thanks for having me. It's great catching up with you. Excellent. Thanks, Jim.